The following video is sponsored by Crunchyroll. More details later on in the video. Every new Zelda game comes with new territories and land to explore. Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, taught us that. And though Hyrule remains a rather conservative land in terms of its provinces, we have always experienced the land in a new way whenever we played A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. Breath of the Wild followed this formula with central Hyrule being pretty much a callback to Ocarina of Time, the western provinces to Twilight Princess and the east to the original Legend of Zelda. Still, Breath of the Wild introduced an entirely new province never seen before in any Zelda game, Akala, which turned out to be absolutely brilliant despite not hosting a divine beast of its own. So with this in mind and the original map of Breath of the Wild being reused and likely reinvented for the sequel, will we see this map expanded with new provinces? That is what we'll be exploring closely today, but first be sure to leave a like and if you haven't already, subscribe, press the notification bell and again for all notifications to join the realm and our great push for 300,000 subscribers. This map is staying with us, but with Breath of the Wild's greatest asset being exploring new land and territories, will that not be a massive detriment for the sequel? Not necessarily, as the map itself can be reinvented and with the most excellent Zelda main quest and plot to date, things can be very different than back in 2017. No doubt, Breath of the Wild 2 will be more linear and plot heavy than Breath of the Wild, and with it we could see a more typical linear Zelda experience. At the same time, what is the greatest asset of a Zelda game? the element of surprise and to wow the play with brand new vistas, locations and landmarks. Pretty much exactly what the box art of Breath of the Wild was all about. Well, the Japanese and American at least. Stupid European box art, at least I got the Japanese OG one for cheap. Back to the point. Breath of the Wild was a fresh and well, wild experience for nearly all of us. The only way to maintain the magic of the four years of discovery and curiosity is to add more content and more importantly, new areas to explore. These can go in four different directions. North like in Zelda 2, East like in The Wind Waker with its great sea and islands, underground as it was teased in the reveal trail of Breath of the Wild sequel, and up into the sky into the domain of Dinral, Nadra and Farish. At the same time, out of these four directions of expansion, the magic variety cannot be recreated the same way in a linear underground cave. Yes, the reveal trailer revealed that underground areas can be extremely impressive, but at the same time very dark as in visibility, and also looking like more of a linear ordeal compared to the narrow unrestricted freedom of exploration that we enjoyed in all of Breath of the Wild's eight provinces. In other words, the underground alone will not be enough, and once again turn Zelda into a linear tour instead of the fun, go where you want, how you want and when you want experience that we got used to in Breath of the Wild. It goes without saying that entering and challenging Ganondorf at the castle to the decisive duel within the first hour of the game is out of the question with the castle, much like in Paper Mario Dorigami King, taking off in the sequel and with rumours of bigger chunks of this map blocked by thick malice, the exploration in this game looks more similar to what we saw in Twilight Princess rather than Breath of the Wild. Now, there are a number of ways that the Zelda team can expand the existing map of Hyrule, as already teased on the ground through a network of shafts or tunnels, through expanding its seas and adding more islands of the size of Eventide, or even bigger, as we explored in our expansions of Hyrule Seas episode, and by extending the already massive open air masses of Hyrule, or even by reaching for the skies. The theme of duality in the Zelda series has existed since A Link to the Past, and the concept of light and dark is well legendary at this point. In a way, it does make sense that Breath of the Wild 2, as the reveal trailer suggests, follows this path and maintains the surface of Hyrule as open as ever. And since we cannot add amazing cities to the surface because of the big depopulation of Hyrule a century ago, why not have a big city underground, just like the town of Salt in Velichka, Poland, which I explored with Monster Maze last year, or the undergrounds of the capital of Mithras in Attack on Titan, Shingeki no Kyoji. My favourite manga and anime, which I'm certain as Zelda fans that you will also fall in love with, if you haven't already. And thanks to Crunchyroll Premium, I'm able to read the latest manga chapters of this incredible struggle for survival and relive the three existing seasons of this masterpiece of an anime. What more do I need to say? Japan's best anime right at your fingertips and new episodes that are up mere hours after they air on the home islands. Naturally, with professionally translated English subtitles, play some 1080p episodes, which are unlimited to watch, completely ad-free and on all your favourite devices. 
Why am I saying this? As the climax of Attack on Titan has started in the manga. The fourth and the final season of the anime will premiere this fall on Crunchyroll, and let me tell you, you don't want to miss one of the greatest finals found in the manga and anime industry. And by going to crunchyroll.com slash commonwealth or clicking the link in the description, you can get your 14 day free trial of Crunchyroll Premium and support us in the Commonwealth realm greatly. Plus you can read or catch up on Attack on Titan. If you still haven't discovered timeless shows like Food Wars, One Punch Man and Berserk, then it is time to open your eyes and discover why Japanese animations inspired the art style of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and its sequel. Once again, that's crunchyroll.com slash commonwealth. Click the link in the description, sign up for the free trial, support the channel this way and then follow and tweet me at common realm with a picture of your sign up and I will follow you back so we can talk about anime and the art direction of Breath of the Wild 1 and 2. Or feel free to let me know in the comments what I should watch next on Crunchyroll. I think that covers the Luminous Stones filled undergrounds quite nicely. And since we covered New Islands and Hyrule Seas in the episode that you find in the top right card, let's talk about what I think will end up as the two new boundaries inside Breath of the Wild sequel. In fact, my logic is rather simple as it ties to Twilight Princess. So here's your spoiler warning if you haven't played that Zelda game, as in the next few minutes we'll be spoiling all the new provinces that were added in that game. Just so you know, you have been warned, okay? Then you may remember that Twilight Princess Get away or be spoiled, granted us three brand new iconic Zelda locations in the later half of the game. Snow Peak, the City in the Sky and the Twilight Realm, Palace of Twilight. Naturally, we already have Hebra in Breath of the Wild. Then what about this vision by Harry Dowlington of an ancient Stonehenge-like mountain province filled with mammoths? Or this fairy tale like forest where you don't get sucked away by fog and meet actual humanoid individuals instead of Koroks? Two great examples which are linked in the description down below. But more importantly, an illustration of what two entirely new areas or provinces can look like in Breath of the Wild 2. But where would the map expand? The western edge of Hyrule is as inhospitable and hard to reach as it gets, so I highly doubt that we will see a map extension in that direction. For the south, I only see an expansion of the sea to surround a small part of this section of Hyrule that is still not connected with the Faran Sea. The east has only long coasts, and the only logical thing to do is to expand its seas and include some new islands. These should be bigger if they are the only extension to the existing map with settlements and humanoid creatures, or maybe seasaurs, which leaves us with the north and more specifically the boundary north of Typhlo ruins. This former town from times unknown is likely going to serve an important purpose and if not all of its people took part in the sealing of Ganondorf then perhaps instead of living down in the depths they left Hyrule's boundaries for a new province up north. A province with the biggest settlement in the entire game to compensate for the castle town we never got to explore, the best dungeons in the entire Zelda series. Often in Zelda games, brand new provinces become our favorites as the development team has greater liberty with these than say with Death Mountain. They can add non-traditional landscapes, races, settlements and dungeons. Snow Peak, the Yeti, getting down the mountain and finally realizing that the dungeon of the province was a massive ruined mansion was one of the most brilliant surprises and additions in Twilight Princess and in fact the entire Zelda series. This is exactly what Breath of the Wild's sequel needs brand new provinces as they are among the most memorable when we look back after playing the game. That unexpected sense of discovery that we made after tens of hours of traversing or branching underground caves and trekking through the same provinces found in Breath of the Wild. That is the true reward that Breath of the Wild 2 should deliver. Preferably, we would have two new provinces up north, which we can explore in a non-linear fashion, to recreate at least some of the freedom and magic of exploring uncharted territory in Breath of the Wild. Another case in point is another brand new location that was added in Twilight Princess, the city in the sky. Now, it can be argued that this entire structure is a dungeon, but with the introduction of Skyloft and Skyward Sword, that was settled once and for all. This province has already grown to become a classic which we missed in Breath of the Wild, especially with the paraglider fulfilling our dream of controlling the direction which we couldn't with the sailcloth, an intention that was clear in the first gameplay showcase of Breath of the Wild in 2014. The sky was no doubt the limit in Breath of the Wild, that was broken and now we need the return of floating islands and gladly for us, Harry Darlington also illustrated how a province in the sky could look like and I must say, wow. Imagine using the paraglider to traverse from floating island to floating island, using currents and upstreams and you know what, with the team from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and their floating titans, I wouldn't be surprised if this is already in the work for the sequel. 
especially if they become a crucial part of the latest chase of the Ganondorf's floating castle. A proper city in the sky that isn't a dungeon, but which also has a dungeon where we paraglide from one small island to another. That in itself would be absolutely incredible and make Breath of the Wild stand on its own. Much like Twilight Princess did, despite closely following in Ocarina of Time's footsteps. And this is why Breath of the Wild 2 must have new provinces that are more than just one type of rock based on the ground interior that will quickly grow dull. Still, I feel like we're forgetting something important. Hmm. Ah yes, travel to new dimensions and realms, or time travel to experience ruined locations in their prime. One of my biggest gripes with Twilight Princess, back in the day, is that the Twilight Realm was only represented with the dungeon, the Palace of Twilight, and that we entered the Twilight Realm too late instead right after finishing the Arbiter's Grounds. Perhaps Breath of the Wild could also fix this missed opportunity, much like Skyward Sword did with the City in the Sky through Skyloft. The same goes with time travel, which who knows could potentially allow us to visit the ruined castle town and central Hyrule before Calamity struck. The point is, there is no reason why Breath of the Wild's sequel should have less ambition in its number of new locations than Twilight Princess, a game that it looks like Breath of the Wild 2 is closely tied to based on the return of Ganondorf, a number of locations found in Breath of the Wild, and he being the source of malice and all plague striking Hyrule, much like in Twilight Princess. But you know what, those are topics for future episodes that will cover inside Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. We hope you enjoyed this episode, liked it, and if you feel the wait for Breath of the Wild 2 and new information on the game is taking too long, then be sure to subscribe, press the notification bell twice, and also check out some of the anime shows on Crunchyroll by clicking the link below, crunchyroll.com slash commonwealth to sign up to a 14 day trial of Crunchyroll Premium. A massive thanks to Crunchyroll for sponsoring this video and for your support to the realm by pressing the link in the description. That's all for now, but be sure to check out one or both of these two awesome videos.